Like I said, I've been studying some apologetics here recently. My pastor is taking an interest in apologetics because he's never really, like he studied it here and there, but he hasn't really gone like, he hasn't dived deep into apologetics. And so essentially what apologetics is, it's not apologizing for your faith. I know it sounds like that by the word, but apologetics is not the art of apologizing for your faith. Apologetics is the art of defending your faith as a Christian. And so I've been reading some William Lane Craig, who is a Christian philosopher. Uh, I've been reading his book called On Guard, Defending Your Faith with uh, Logic and Reason, I think is what it's called. Great book, very good uh, introduction. And the second chapter is dealing with uh, the question, what would it be like if God didn't exist? And I'll get to that here in a second. But so when it comes to apologetics, right, this is something I would encourage every single Christian to get into. Okay. I know when it comes to theology, that's a bit of a buzzword and it's a little intimidating, but apologetics is a branch of that that I think every Christian should engage in because of this verse right here in 1 Peter 3 uh, verses or verse 15. Actually, I'll just read verse 14 as well. Um, no, I'll just read this whole thing. So it says here, 1 Peter 3 verse 14 through 17 but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, talking about people. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So, th these verses here basically tell us, as Christians, make a defense, build a defense, get a defense ready, because people are going to ask you, you know, why do you, why are you so hopeful? Why do you praise Jesus? Why are you so at peace in the midst of 2020 when it's a, a crazy year for everybody? And so we're called here in Scripture to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason. Not just some people, not just a handful of people, but anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So the question we should be asking ourselves is someone came up to me on the street. Well, they shouldn't be coming up to you on the street, social distancing. But if someone comes up to you and approaches you anyway and says, hey, why are you a Christian? Actually, this would be good for us streamers, right? People are going to come into our chats all the time and ask us this. Why are you a Christian? Why do you believe the Bible? Well, we should have a defense ready, right? But not only should we have a defense ready, we should answer them with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. I actually saw a good example of this in Jono's stream earlier this week. Someone was asking him, you know, why does he believe in Jesus? Uh, why does he believe the things that he believes? And he answered them very with gentleness and respect. You know, he was very open, like, hey, I know we probably don't see eye to eye on this, but this is just where I'm at. This is why I believe in Jesus. And he shared his faith right there on stream. And I'm like, that's a perfect example of verse 15 right there. Um, and so we're to do that with gentleness and respect. But I've noticed that, especially just being in youth ministry, a lot of students don't know how to do this. When someone asks them, you know, why do you believe in Jesus? They're not gentle when they respond. They don't show a lot of respect because someone will ask a question of like, well, wait a minute, if you believe this, then what do you believe about this in the Bible? And they're like, well, do you're wrong. You know, or they'll bring up a good question and then they're just like, they lose it. This is something that William Lane Craig talked about in his book on guard, which I would agree with Matt Crumley. It is excellent. I'm only two chapters in, but he talks about, you know, if you know the Bible, and you know the arguments, and you know how to counter them, you won't feel this need to panic when people question you. You'll be able to answer them with gentleness and respect because you know the answers. But the only way that you're gonna know the answers is by getting in the Bible and studying it and knowing it and researching uh, counter arguments to Christianity. One of my favorite quotes by R.C. Sproul is, is he, met, and I'm gonna butcher it, but he talks about the importance of unorthodox teaching. He says that the, the um, like unorthodox teaching 
is good because it challenges us and forces us as Christians to know better and study better Orthodox teaching. And so we should Google, you know, what are some common objections to Christianity? What, uh, what do people have questions about when it comes to Christianity? Some big ones, and this is one that we tackled with my students a few weeks ago, is uh, if God is good, then why is there evil, right? If God is good, then, like, if God is good and he's all-powerful, then why doesn't he just destroy all evil, right? But the flaw with that argument is that the person asking it isn't using the same standard that God is using, right? To them, the evils that they're thinking of are inconveniences to them. But if we look at what God says about evil, and if God were really to destroy all evil, right, that would include the entire human race. That would include everyone. And so it's not so much that people want God to destroy evil, all evil they just want them to they just want him to destroy a particular inconvenience that they're experiencing or a genuine evil that they're seeing but the thing is, is that god is consistent if he's going to destroy one evil he's going to destroy all evil and that would include us so the question then becomes why does god save anyone to begin with that's the real question god doesn't owe us anything so why does he save anyone to begin with that's the real question and a student actually came up to me after youth and, and asked me that very question of, you know, well, if God is all powerful, why doesn't he destroy all evil? I'm like, well, first of all, he will. And then they, I told them that, you know, he will eventually. And then they responded with, well, he hasn't done it. And I'm like, yeah, but just because he hasn't done it yet doesn't mean he won't. Right? So, but we can go into that a little bit later too. But it, it was a really good conversation. I love that that student was asking those questions. But going back to this here, you know, it's good to look up these questions, right? It's good to think about these questions and really dig deep into what the uh, the answers are, right? And so William Lane Craig, he brings this up in the second chapter talking about, you know, us thinking through what if God didn't exist, right? And so he has this quote here that I tweeted out. I'll pull it up real quick and see if I can get it centered into the screen there. Yeah, that'll work for the most part. Again, guys, if you wanna follow me on Twitter, it's just that right there. You can also type in exclamation point socials in the chat and uh, it'll show you in there. Um, but it says here, part of the challenge of getting American people to think about God is that they become so used to God that they just take him for granted. They never think to ask what the implications would be if God did not exist. And I remember reading that and going, you know what, that's a good question right hot a wait, wait, wait subscribe to tier one for two months in advance bro thank you for that man thank you for that i'll sing to you here in a second um we're talking about apologetics getting caught up on here so this is something that i thought i read and i was like that is so good because we should consider that right if God didn't exist, what are the implications of that? We wouldn't have a standard for good and evil, right? We wouldn't even exist. John 1 says that uh, all things were made through him, through Christ. And so, you know, we, we wouldn't even exist. But God does exist. We know that there is good and evil. We know that we can we can test that and see that. So then you just continue developing that thought. And so it's important for us to study apologetics, to look up the questions that people have about our Christian faith and be able to give a defense to anyone who asks us for the reason for our hope, right? And so just wanted to share that. I, I've been reading this, uh, like I said, I've been reading William Lane Craig lately and just really getting into that and and really going through an apologetic series with my students that has been really good for them um, in answering those questions. Actually, I'll, I'll give you guys this information too. Uh, pretty much all of September and October, we've been answering questions from Jonathan Steingard, who was the lead singer of Hawk Nelson, which was a popular Christian punk band back in the early 2000s. And he came out earlier this year and said that he's no longer a Christian. And he listed these series of questions of, uh, of questions that he had and I was like, okay, I'm gonna answer every single one of those questions on a Wednesday night in my youth group, and we did. You know, one of the questions was, um, you know, if God is good, why is there evil? We answered that. 
Um, I can't remember what the other ones were. That was a big one that I remember going over. But yeah, J cubed. You have that tier one sub, dude. At nine months. Get some hypes in the chat for that, man. Get some hypes in the chat for that, man. Oh, man. It was such a heartbreak to watch. It was, man, because I remember listening to Hawk Nelson when I was in youth group. I know that's dating me a little bit. But I was like, how? Like, how do you make these really good songs that lead people to Christ and then just come out later and say that you're not a Christian? It is mind-blowing, man. Mind-blowing. Like, super easy fundamental questions that he got stuck on. I know. And that's the thing. Like, I was reading through the series of questions, and I'm like, these are all very... I don't mean to be, like, mean or anything, but these are all, like, very basic questions you ask when you first become a quish <laughs> when you become a question you ask these question i can't talk guys words are hard but i but that's what we did in my youth group i led the students through uh answering those objections and uh and that's kind of where we've been at so all that to say if you're a christian when you become a question <laughs> i'm gonna be stuck saying that all that to say if you're a christian the Bible tells you to have a defense ready for the faith uh, that you have in you. And so study your Bible, Google some objections that people have against Christianity, and study those arguments. And even look up a William Lane Craig book or article and, and, and read that as well uh, and check it out. So it's important to know this stuff so that way you don't panic when people ask you uh, why you're a Christian. But it's also important for you to know as well, because there's going to be days where you doubt your own faith and you can come back to the evidence that you have and lean on that. So hopefully that helps. Hopefully that helps. If you're watching this on YouTube later, feel free to leave a comment down below and uh, let's continue the conversation there. But yeah.